The thrill-seeking white militants claimed they were inspired by the Black Power Movement, particularly by the gun-toting Black Panther Party, which had come to prominence in Oakland, California. But in fact, the Black Panthers were a far more sophisticated political organization than their white imitators would ever be, and had a far different agenda. What they represented for the black community was something extremely positive. They represented, in a sense, a new and different form of what we traditionally call in our community the talented tenth. This is the notion that the best of our community has to put his education and resources at the disposal of the community. Prior to the middle 60s, I had always been defined in terms of highly educated middle class black people. Here, on the other hand, we have relatively uneducated young black street people who find that they have resources within themselves, which through organization can begin to transform the community. That's why they caught on so fast. They represented the organizational expression of all the people on the corners without work, outside in the schoolyards without an education, uh, without an identity, but with an agenda for manhood and for achievement, hopefully, in this country. The 10-point program, number one, we want freedom. We want the power to control the destiny of our black community. Number two, we want full employment for our people. Number three, we want an end to the robbery by the white man of our black community. Number four, we want... Most white Americans saw only their guns and heard only their violent rhetoric. But black militant groups like the Black Panthers were the demanding voice of a younger generation that had given up on Martin Luther King's nonviolent tactics. Their implied threats of violence and their radical political agenda made them extremely frightening to mainstream America. We want all black people when brought to court to be tried by a jury of their peers or people from their black communities as defined in the Constitution. Number 10, we want land, justice, housing, education, clothing, and peace. And as a major political objective, a United Nations supervised plebiscite to be held throughout the black colonies of America in which only black people will participate to decide or determine the will of black people as to their national destiny. Right on, brother. Thank you. Right on. Right on. Our parents were very negative about the Black Panthers. And so whenever you mentioned it in my house, my mother would go loopy. But um, once I started to talk with a lot of people and people who were affiliated with the Black Panther Party, uh, I decided that they had a good program and that um, I really started looking inwardly at myself and who I was and uh, where I was going and what I wanted to do and what I wanted my children to be uh, or how they would grow. And would they grow with this inferiority complex that the white society had pushed on us so long? And I decided that I wanted to go the route of the Black Panther. As the Panthers organized voter registration drives, health centers, and food distribution programs, they won growing support in black communities nationwide. But an escalating cycle of shootouts, arrests, and eventually what Panthers claimed were assassinations by police led to the almost complete elimination of the Black Panther Party by the early 1970s. How do they die? Hey, in 1969, the FBI, through its counterintelligence program, targeted the Panthers for elimination. There's plenty of documentary evidence that shows this. In that year alone, in 1969, 26 Panthers were killed by local law enforcement agents and 750 Panthers were imprisoned or jailed. The organization was largely destroyed systematically by the local and federal authorities. The difference I would say between the civil rights movement of 1954 to 68 and the black power movement was that the civil rights movement sought equality with whites and it was a middle-class movement. 
the black power movement assumed the quality of person and merely sought the opportunity to express that equality by saying we are a proud people. We don't need you to tell us that. Our kinky hair is glorious. Uh, who our black skin is something we're proud of. Uh, and we are who we are. Now we merely seek uh, to express that. Uh, you, young man, you come here. You're a Negro. No. I am your teacher. You are a Negro. No. Suppose I threatened to beat you, what would you say? Aren't you a Negro now? No. What are you? I'm black and beautiful. What is your nationality? My nationality is Afro-American. Suppose I had some money in my pocket. Suppose I gave you a dollar to say that you're an Af American Negro. This is money now. Money talks. Money talks. This dollar. And if you don't say it, you don't get it. You're an American Negro, aren't you? No. You won't have any money. You know you need money, don't you? Yeah. You need money to live, don't you? Yeah. All right. All you have to say, Leon, is that you're an American Negro. Aren't you an American Negro? Are you an American Negro? No. What are you? I'm black and beautiful. What's your nationality? My nationality is Afro-American. Very good, man. Keep it up. Go sit down. You had to think about that a minute, didn't you? Yeah. All right. All right, everybody. What is your nationality? My nationality is was very meaningful. I remember getting my afro. I used to, you know, straighten my hair with the chemicals and you'd burn your head and it was very expensive and you know, and I remember showing your africanness and your blackness um by wearing an afro. And I remember having beautiful dashikis, beautiful it's like a a garment that's like a, a shirt with beautiful brilliant colors and you just had this regal sense. I also remember learning for the first time in college that African culture was a wonderful culture. It wasn't ooga booga and idiot people, you know, running through the jungles. We were very brilliant and had great cultures. I remember the pictures of the African kings and queens and there was this whole sense of, hey, this is all right. And reading uh, Lerone Bennett's book before the Mayflower in African American studies, you are denied that history in at least as I was uh, growing up in the 1950s and 60s. Nobody tells you that. And it looked like everywhere you went, somebody was trying to see who could be the blackest and whatever, you know, <laughs> where it was. And on, uh, uh, somebody getting up on a box, making a speech. And somebody was, uh, 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 a brother was always trying to show he was blacker than somebody else. We went through a heavy wave of African, Swahili, the language. Then we begin to name our children, African names. Uh, in our home, every, what, Wednesday night? Friday. Every Friday, my husband gave our children an assignment. They had to learn something about Africa and report on it. And, and, and it, it, it paid off. It really did. It paid off, you know. And, and today, they really appreciate it. You don't have, I mean, you don't have to go around wearing it on your collar, but it comes out, and you know who you are. This experience, which black Americans were having, did not go unnoticed by the rest of America. Something had started that was beginning to spread, a new kind of pride, identity, and consciousness that was about to turn the mass movements of the 1960s into new and different forms of activism. 
Now, we fought the public accommodation fight 10 years ago with the blacks. Are we going to have to start all over again with women? How about, would you like a sign up there that said blacks only or whites only? It's the same principle, same sir. We are, women are persons. Women yeah, are people. Persons, and we want to be able to come and go through it, and we don't want to be intimidated by signs that say men's buffet. I have no intentions of taking the sign down or changing the sign. If you can get a court order to take it down, fine. You have no intention of no. changing your policy of no. segregated facilities. Is that correct, sir? If you women are that hard up for a, a glass of beer, I'll be glad to serve you to bar. You know, sometimes the events of decades can crystallize in a moment, and it seems as if overnight there's this historic change. When you look back at it, you say, oh, well, this was building up and building up, and for years there was this person and this person and this group, and they were networking and this and this, and then there was a, a shift. Um, the women's movement had many origins. In part, it owes its renewed birth to the civil rights movement, because there was then a lesson for the women of America of how blacks at that time were taking their life into their own hands. Is my bacon ready yet? 20 past 8. Some more toast, team. Hey, Pete, why don't you get cracking on a thorough fall house cleaning campaign around here? Get the floors waxed, get the windows washed, get this place looking as if civilized people are in residence, hmm? Gee, that's a little light, isn't it? Sorry, I hurried it. Sweetie, have a little more damn some plum preserves. In 1970, America was still very much a man's world. More women than ever were joining the workforce, but at the same time, they were still expected to be the traditional housewives and mothers of a generation earlier. In some states, women could not obtain credit cards or mortgages without a male cosigner, and nationally, they were paid an average of 59 cents for every dollar a man earned. In short, American women were still second-class citizens. It's hard for a kid growing up now to realize that in 1964, 5, 6, whenever, if a woman sat on a park bench reading a book, chances were she would be interrupted and that the man who came up to her would assume that she would rather talk to him than read the book. If two women were in a restaurant eating together, it was common for a man or a couple of men to come up to them and assume that they were there to be talked to and that they weren't there for any purpose of themselves. It's hard to believe that this happened because it doesn't, and that really has changed. I mean, there really have been significant changes in our relationships, and, uh, but that was not true in, in the 60s. And so what began to happen in 1970, 71, is that women began to they set up these consciousness raising groups in which they would, for the first time, not be interrupted. And everything was talked about, you know, everything from high school to your first menstruation to your first sex to go, you know, everything was talked about. But the principle was that you went around in a circle and no one interrupted you. The biggest change, which is still affecting me, is that I now really like women, and I didn't like women before. Women were not um, usually educated, they were not usually very vital, they were usually passive, so I thought men were cooler. I don't want to see women adopting a lot of the 
I think bad characteristics are usually considered masculine, such as um, aggressiveness up to the point of fighting. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that you know, we do not want to become that way. But we are in that way. We see men become soft. Women and get not fight in a different way. way. It was like a flash ignition. It would be like lighting your gas furnace, and it would just go boom. And all of a sudden, um, you had insight into things that had happened in the past, and you were able to move forward with this insight. It changed your whole context, and it happened in a, in a, a group with other people who were experiencing the same thing. So you felt validated. You didn't feel crazy anymore. And you knew that uh, really what you were saying and feeling was the truth. And that's when women suddenly understood that their own personal history was significant. And that's where the phrase, the personal is political, came from. And that connection of realizing that the personal is political and therefore justifies political action uh, was one of the revolutionary ideas of the beginning of the women's movement. moment in which all this prior organizing exploded was in 1970. It was the women's strike. The theme of it was, don't iron while the strike is hot. And there was a massive demonstration for women's rights. Well, the main demand, of course, is equal, equal rights. Equal rights to have a job, to have respect, to not be viewed as a piece of meat. Equal rights to, uh, to set forth our own humanity, equal rights to get into graduate programs, to get into schools, to training programs. We're the bottom third of the employment in terms of pay. We represent nonetheless 34% of the workforce, yet we're the first to be laid off and the last to be hired. There aren't frivolous demands at all. We just want what men have had all these years. I think we were willing to stand up and get get slugged, slug it out if necessary, to make our point known. Because we share that amongst ourselves, that probably gave us the encouragement to continue on on that path, that we weren't alone. We were all feeling it. I, in particular, felt it. And I made sure that my husband knew I was feeling it. He wasn't, he, he could n no longer expect me to be as his mother was with his father, because I wasn't going to do that. I wanted more. It didn't make for harmony, but it did make for change. Like a wave rolling across America, the changes came, sometimes surprising, often shocking. By 1970, the passions of the 60s were being channeled into a social revolution more widespread than anyone could have imagined a decade earlier. In 1969, in New York City, there was a riot that took place. The police routinely raided the bars in New York. No big deal. It happened all the time. At the end of June of 1969, for a number of reasons, the patrons fought back. And there was a riot that lasted for three days. But shortly thereafter, a call went out that a new organization was formed called the Gay Liberation Front. And the name, of course, was modeled after the Vietnamese Liberation Front, those words. And I think really was inspired by the rise of the black movement, or there were examples on the media day after day of black people rising up and fighting back, the riots in Harlem. It was, it was an image that was in the air all the time the image of the anti-war protesters, and of course women were writing articles about feminism. All of these images were reinforcing. And the reinforced message was, it's right to rebel. Suddenly, there were hundreds of new organizations formed by small groups of people who felt a common cause. In New York City, Puerto Ricans joined the Young Lords. In South Dakota, the American Indian movement aimed to right wrongs a century old. I was sitting in prison, looking at this whole movement, uh, 
civil rights and the anti-war movement passing us by. And I wanted to get out so bad to, to, to be part of this movement that was going on. There was a new feeling out there of, of, of a different kind of patriotism, patriotism to human rights, patriotism to, to life instead of death. I wanted to be part of it. I mean, just going to the police department in mass, there was like 200 of us going right directly to the police department. Here we were scared to go to the police department and just two weeks before that, scared to go by ourselves. But yet I found strength with two, 200 of us going up, all Indian people, all Indians who had been beaten, who had been mugged, who had been arrested. Now here we were, we're going back to, the, to that same police department that, that arrested us, and we were demanding action. And it felt good to finally sense there was power in, in unity, there was power in numbers, and I felt good. That feeling came to be called empowerment, it meant taking control of your own life, denying the right of the government or any other big institution to tell you how to live. The political causes of a few years earlier tried to change the world. This new political activism took aim at local issues like utility rates, highway construction, taxes, rent control. Well, let's have a demonstration like those students have yeah, in the colleges. Mark, when the colleges, when the colleges, you the college kid no more. What do they do the American Revolution? What did they do in the American Revolution? They fought back and they won. By the end of the 60s, going into the 70s, it was clear, particularly to the youth of America, that um, they were extraordinarily successful. They said something. They raised an issue. And the world around them changed. An extraordinarily powerful group of people. They could get issues on the agenda very, very quickly. They began in the early 60s with mega issues, with big issues. But with their increasing success um, and with their increasing focus on themselves, their own personal concerns, the sense that their lives uh, were the most important lives around, they looked for more and more personal issues to express themselves about. And it was kind of like a momentum gathering, success feeding on success. More and more issues got articulated for the national agenda. When this picture of Earth appeared in 1969, taken from the moon by America's astronauts, people around the world suddenly saw the planet from a startling new perspective. It was this fragile-looking image that was the catalyst for a new cause. Coincidentally, it was April 1970, the same month Richard Nixon invaded Cambodia, that America celebrated its first Earth Day. Earth Day was everything we could possibly have hoped it would be. It was a tremendous outpouring of people into the city at a time when there was so much conflict and, and violence and hostility in the air. It was an outpouring of faith in the future. It was a moment of glamour and fulfillment. Quarter of a million people packing the streets on every side, the first time that the city had closed itself down to give itself to its people, no cars. It was a, it was a moment of sheer wonder and, and affirmation. As the 1970s unfolded, we were a new and different nation. 
The violent protests were gone, but in their place were a million different voices raising a hundred separate issues. It was a new form of political dialogue, the single issue cause. From rural America to the nation's capital, citizens demanded their individual grievances be heard. Using the tactics of protest and grassroots organizing that had proved so effective for students, farmers, senior citizens, disabled Americans, and a host of others adopted a new form of politicking. Sending direct mail messages to millions of homes, knocking on doors in towns and cities across the country, it was America's growing conservative movement, especially, that used the single issue cause to best effect. Choosing moral issues that individuals cared about deeply, conservatives reached out to millions of people, enlisting them in a new conservative groundswell. But for one group of young people, the 1970s would promise only the continuation of some unfinished business of the 60s. Just as Americans were unable to resolve the Vietnam War, the nation seemed unable to resolve its feelings toward the men who had been sent to fight. One poll reported that a majority of Americans believed Vietnam vets were suckers for risking their lives in the wrong place at the wrong time. For Skip Walsh, Sheriff of Sarasota, Florida, an Army Commendation Medal, and all my stuff. Terry DeMott, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, Purple Heart, and CIV. When hundreds of vets lined up in front of the Capitol to throw away their service medals, they were expressing more than just resistance to the war. They were expressing their frustration and their anger with a nation that was unable to distinguish between its opposition to the war and to the warriors who had fought it. Combat in Vietnam was a lot easier than coming home. Being on the battlefield was much more understandable. You knew who the enemy was. You fought the enemy. Much simpler. When you came home, it was very, very, very confusing. I mean, during the 60s, when it was vogue to take a black lunch, during the 60s, when the women's movement was just starting, during the 60s, when the Hispanics and brown power were starting, during all the movements, our movement, who wanted to take a Vietnam veteran to lunch? You know, people say, how come you guys lost your war? I mean, guys from the big one, from World War II. And I said, I just shrugged. And I said, look, you know, we did pretty damn well with the only war that your generation gave us. We didn't set policy. I was 23 and I was old. Most kids were 19. So you tell me what was the difference between a returning veteran in World War II and a returning veteran in Vietnam? After World War II, you could not get elected to the United States Congress or Senate or the White House unless you served in uniform. After Vietnam, you couldn't get elected to anything if you did serve in uniform. It's a big difference. of heroes was over, and over too, for many of the 60s generation, was faith in a just and fair federal government that would be by and for the people. One event more than any other signifies the end of the era for this group, Watergate. As the sordid facts about the corruption, the spying, and the lying began to seep out from Richard Nixon's White House, Americans realized the truth was even more shocking than Nixon's worst critics had charged. The man who had promised us law and order came to be a lawbreaker himself. I began by telling the president that there was a cancer growing on the presidency. And if the cancer was not removed, the president himself would be killed by it. I also told him that it was important that this cancer be removed immediately because it was growing more deadly every day. 
A profound disillusionment set in among many of the same 60s generation that had been so hopeful a decade earlier. Disillusionment so pervasive and so widespread that by 1973, polls showed more than half the nation believed the federal government was corrupt. Several months later, when Nixon finally resigned rather than face impeachment, Americans were relieved to put Watergate behind them. And the following spring, as the last American soldiers made their hasty withdrawal from Vietnam, ditching their helicopters as they went, another long, unhappy chapter of the 1960s finally reached its end. Pictures of the helicopter leaving the embassy was not as profound to me as the pictures that they took from the carrier after that of shoving the Hueys off the deck and into the drink. And I guess for me, uh, it was the symbolism was, we don't need you guys anymore, so into the drink. Uh, I think that that's what, that's what uh, the image that, that really struck me very, very strong was they want to throw us away. The 1960s were over, and with the end of the era came a series of shocks. Scarce and expensive resources, high unemployment, galloping inflation, and on the world stage, continuing reminders that America could no longer count on winning its battles every time. The optimism, the hope, the boundless belief that young Americans could make the world a better place to live had all but disappeared. The party was over. The innocence was gone. 